everyone. Uh, thank you for attending our um, our workshop here, or summit, or seminar, whichever one you want to call it. But our next speaker is uh, Tom Pierce, and normally I would read, you know, a bio and introduce. But you know what? What better person to introduce himself than himself? <laughs> All right, let's give a, a hand for Tom Pierce. Thank you, Joseph. Um, I want to start by um, actually saying a thanks to Hope before she runs away and to Tim, who has been uh, just an amazing organizer behind this. Hope, hey, Hope and Tim, could I get you guys up here for just a moment? Oh, come on, come on. You know, there's a first step when you walk on a trail and there's a first step when you're starting a new vision for all of Hawaii, not just Kauai, but for all of Hawaii. And I want to thank Hope and Tim for sticking their neck out and taking that first step. And I, what I have with me, this is um, a guide post and a finger post with um, an ahu. This is a photograph from the Haleakala Trail, which um, is a case I've been involved in for the last, since 2007, and we have a jury award uh, confirming that this is a public trail, and, which is a very significant event, and I'll be talking about that more. This is a photograph, so I'm just uh, passing on a little bit of additional hope, as, as Richard talked about it, um, over from Maui to Kauai. So th thanks to Hope and Tim, um, we're here today. It's so exciting and humbling for me to be in the same room with so many people who have been working on these issues for so long. And um, what I'd like to do is, um, actually first one of the things I just want to talk about in terms of what a, what a wonderful thing this is and how inspiring it is, is that not so long ago, and I just got this feeling because Dr. Richard Stevens was standing here and I was sitting right back there and I don't know how that happened that I happened to be sitting in that spot, but it was almost the same spot that in the same distance that we were from each other in court for days and days just earlier this year. And he was explaining a lot of the same things that he has been explaining to you to a jury, a jury of our peers, which is very, very powerful, selected from a, a, a gigantic panel of of jurors that the, that the judge had come in for two days while we selected jurors. So what is just incredibly powerful is the very information that Richard has been able to pass on to you with some of the information that we were able to have. Dr. Richard Stevens qualified as an expert witness after a hotly contested challenge of his authority. And the judge qualified him as a world historian and as a trail researcher. This is very powerful to be able to win these kinds of significant, you know, just that part took days of briefing and some pretty significant hearings. But so here we are today, sitting across each, from each other in a whole different kind of situation, less tense, much more enjoyable, and, but still at the same time, very, very powerful to me to uh, have had that. So it's been the support of uh, Richard. And I also want to point out one other person here at the beginning which is Moana Rowland, who is the state abstractor. Moana, if you feel, feel comfortable, if you don't mind st standing up, a lot of you know her, but... Um, I'll, t I'll talk about it a little bit more, but Moana was there through, I think, every day of the entire hearing, and we're talking about a six-week jury trial. Um, so pretty significant commitment of time, and she was there for all of it, listening to it, and also was a testifier in support of our case, and Moana was the person who back in uh, the late 1990s and 2000s had issued a report with respect to Haleakala Trail, identifying it as a trail that was um, a public trail. So with that said, I'm gonna jump in. I gave a, spe a, a talk to the Kauai Open Space Commission on Thursday, and um, I'm gonna be uh, using just a portion of that. Uh, and I, the other thing I would just say for folks on Kauai is that I just think you have an incredible organization there. I was amazed at the receptivity of uh, that group of, of folks and their interest and their uh, respect for these issues. So I think 
you already have a great start there in terms of decision makers in your community who care. The next thing um, I just, uh, and where I'm going to really focus on, there's a lot of other side issues, but for the sake of being focused and permitting other folks here to have an opportunity to um, uh, uh, share what they, their knowledge, I'm going to keep this very focused on the legal side, which is, uh, you, may, you may find interesting or may put you to sleep, and I feel sorry for any of you who had to sit through this twice because you're at the Open Space Commission, but I'll try to make it a little bit different this time. We'll see how it goes. Um, so my focus today, and this is the thing I've heard again and again this, uh, as we were walking trails yesterday and talking to each other, is that people don't know what the law is. Uh, and the wealth of trail law that ha Hawaii has, which makes it unique, even though there's some very significant strong trail types of laws throughout the United States, Hawaii has some specific ones that are particularly unique. And one of the things that uh, Richard talked about was this is the age of restoration. And what I also hope it is from a legal perspective is um, the age of recollection. And what I mean by that is that these laws are no less powerful than they were during Hawaiian times or during early Western times when everything was being codified. And that's what I hope you leave here today is with the, with the knowledge and the, the confidence that when you go out and talk about these issues that, um, and you talk about the rights that you have as, that are associated with trails, that you know that in fact the law is behind you. The problem is that some of these have been forgotten over time or they've been intentionally cast to the side as not being meaningful. There's an earlier case from 2000, the Hokulia case, that uh, uh, where these issues came up in the circuit court and there the circuit court found that an old ancient trail was a public trail. That was a heavily litigated case against a big landowner. The same thing happened in our case uh, where we were able to show that an ancient trail, as it was improved over time, was a public trail. So we have two significant landmark cases here within the last 15 years um, that really, I think, set the stage and show you that these, um, that these laws are meaningful and they mean something. So with all that said, let's jump into it. Um, I'm going to just summarize a few things I talked about with the Open Space Commission. Is there a clear path? There are certain parts of this that are very complicated. Use issues. I'm going to talk about public rights and the underlying ownership of trails, okay, because that's one of the big issues. But I'm leaving to the side, and I'm sure it'll come up today, or it'll come up in one of the next workshops. We've got to also work through public access issues. But I'll tell you what I told the commissioners is that what decision makers cannot do, what they cannot do is simply ignore this issue because it is complicated. They cannot do that. And I hope to leave you with one of the final things is that the decision makers, whether they be the Open Space Commission, all your other uh, agent commissions that you have here on Kauai, the county council, and the state agencies, for example, Department of Land and Natural Resources and BLNR, they have a fiduciary responsibility. They are trustees of this public trust asset, which is, this is part of our commons, these trails, this web of life, as Richard talked about it. This is something that has a significance to us from the past, has a significance to us right now, and it has a significance to us in the future. So what we need to do, and what I'm asking decision makers to do, what I'm asking you to do today as you leave and think about how you, how you go to the next step is to take this opportunity and say, we've got something here that we need to educate all of our leaders and make sure that we no longer have to fight these things out in court, but we can explain this to our leaders to where they can make decisions for us and start leading the way and talking to landowners and other corporations, whoever it needs to be at the, at the bigger level that look, this is important to us and we're gonna figure out how to resolve these issues because unfortunately, we really need to find a way to do it other than litigation where we can. Okay, so there is there a clear path? There's, there's certainly a clear path and that I'll leave you with in terms of ownership of trails and who has rights with respect to them. With, with respect to use issues, each trail is unique and there'll be certain things. Richard talked about Malcolm Mackay trails that might have been used uh, by all sorts of different kinds of folks. Those are issues I'm not going to hit on today, but they're very important. Who has a right to use a particular trail to make sure that it continues to be used for the right purposes? 
whether that be for Hawaiian cultural practices or um, for other practices. In the case of Haleakala Trail, whoops, I may have In the case of Haleakala Trail, we were dealing with an overland trail. So this is the entire island of Maui, and right here is Haleakala Crater. And this green line coming down like this was a summit trail that was originally created by the Hawaiians, um, potentially used for centuries. And then also that same route came up through the crater and down to Kalpo, so it created an overland passage. And David Malo, who many of you may know, was one of the first um, people, uh, uh, first Hawaiians at, that we know of, of a written account, who actually took uh, some of the missionaries through from Kalpo to the other side. And, um, and what he explained, and this is when he was uh, quite elderly, and there was a couple of people with him that reported it and put it in the newspaper, and uh, what he explained was that this was a way that could actually be used in the course of a day. And, uh, and it's about 25 miles, so a, a strong person could make this and use that trail in the course of a day. It was used, based upon archaeology, it was used for obviously for cultural practices within Haleakala Crater. There were quarries there, there were heiau, and there was certainly, uh, also it was used by warring parties when they were going between both sides of the island. Okay, I'm going to jump right in and talk about uh, the wealth of trail law, and we'll talk a little bit at the end about, a little bit more about Haleakala Trail. Oops, it'll help if I push the right button. Here we go. This, I'll just go back, I'm not going to spend time, but this is one of the guideposts that remains uh, with the Ahu. Uh, this is on Haleakala Trail. That was created by the Territory of Hawaii during a public works project that they were doing at that point in time. So these are still, we found over 40 Ahu still showing uh, the way on this trail from Makawao up to the National Park boundary, which is about 3.3 miles. Why save ancient trails? I think Richard has done a fantastic job of talking about that, so I'd like to pass over that and um, go right into the law. The best way for me to explain this is actually by starting, jumping ahead to 1892. And what's important that happened in 1892 was we have this thing called the Judiciary Act. What you need to know about it is and what's uh, helpful for decision makers to know is that at that point in time, there was a, a and it's, it's actually, it's HRS, the Hawaii, Hawaii Revised Statute, 1-1. One -one. Okay, so it's the very first beginning of our, our statutory legal scheme. And it says, we adopt today all of the Western laws, all the common laws. So what we're talking about is everything that comes over all the way from Roman times, which is what is the basis of our uh, legal system, our American legal system. This came over from the Romans originally. And the reason I want to mention that is that uh, embedded all the way back into the earliest of, of times, of written times, uh, embedded in that was the concept of public trust, the public trust concept, that the commons, something that is, that is used by the commons is, needs to be protected and that there's an obligation that goes along with that protection. So um, at that point in time, uh, this Judiciary Act was put in place, but it doesn't just talk about Western laws. That's what's really powerful, is it talks about the Western laws are in place except where there are Hawaiian laws that take precedence. And I'll show you exactly the language in a moment. But what I'm going to do is, uh, the way that I have this organized is that we're going to talk about the Hawaiian laws that are important to trails. And you'll see that they start with a fundamental property law concept, which I'll talk about. Then it starts with 1797, the law of the splintered paddle. And it can, continues through to the Highways Act of 1892. And then we'll talk about a couple of the Western laws um, that really go back to the Roman times in terms of uh, the public trust doctrine. Okay. The other thing that I think is very powerful is that even though I'm telling you about this, these things today, I'm going to be showing you that um, we persuaded the court, and the court concluded that we were right on these issues, and these were instructions that were literally read to the jury back in May of this year. 
So what this instruction says, the common law of England, this is the Judiciary Act, common law of England as ascertained by English and American decisions is hereby declared to be the common law of the Hawaiian Islands in all cases except as otherwise expressly provided by the Hawaiian Constitution, and they're talking about the Hawaiian Constitution that was in place at the earliest times, we'll, we'll come back to that, were laws or fixed by Hawaiian judicial precedent. They were ag agreeing to take on all the Hawaiian precedent that was happening at that time. It related to kulianas, all sorts of different things like that. Or established by Hawaiian national usage. Now, Hawaiian national usage, we would say that a little bit differently now. We're talking about those rights that were embedded in how Hawaii was functioning before Westerners arrived. So this is a very, very powerful law in terms of what it is validating remains on the books today. And that's something that certainly is still being grappled with with the courts, but we've had uh, some pretty impressive decisions over the last 20 years, including the Pash decision, that really goes back to this point as well. Uh, by the way, the Judiciary Act, you'll see that that um, was one of the laws that was signed by Queen Lilio Kalani. Fundamental property law, a fundamental concept, and once again, when you see these typewritten ones like this, these were typed up by the court and presented to the jury and, it, and the ju judge's instructions before the jury went in to deliberate. And these were based upon the work, uh, the, the opposing parties fighting over the issues, and this was the ultimate conclusions that the judge reached in terms of the instructions. In Hawaiian property law, land in its original state is public land. And if not awarded or granted, such land remains in the public domain. So the point here is, if it was never given away to a private interest, it remains in public hands. And that is, um, so you, one of the things that you look at through the deeds process is what was given away to the private parties uh, at the earliest uh, days and what wasn't. The law of the splintered paddle, the reason I have this here is I think it's, um, from my perspective, it's an enunciation by uh, King Kamehameha I of the commons concept. The fact that respect alike, people both great and humble, be free to go forth and lie in the road. I think it's, um, there's a lot of different ways that this law could have been written, but the fact that it involves roads, aloha, trails, um, I think is very powerful. It shows the importance that these were, these were not just trails for certain people, they were trails for everyone. So the fact that young and old could go and be free and safe there was very important. The overarching concept was that I am respecting the commons and I understand that that's something that is important for a king to do or a government to do. Okay, you recall that the Judiciary Act says um, Western laws apply except one of the exceptions is the Hawaii Constitution. So here's an important part from the, the Constitution from 1840. This is King Kamehameha III. And, and I'll just go ahead and say, uh, th it was promulgated by King Kamehameha III, but it goes back and says, Kamehameha I was the founder of the kingdom, and to him belonged all land from one end of the islands to the other. And that's a typo there. Uh, though, and I'll just let you know that the court was typing these things up after midnight because that's how much we were, the, the midnight before the jury instructions were gone. So the staff folks were working late in the evening when this happened. Um, belonged all, all, all land from one end of the islands to the other, though it was not his own private property. It belonged to the chiefs and the people in common. So that is, once again, identifying that commons aspect. Then we have the Great Land Division, Mahele. That occurs in 1848. That's where the king is conveying away certain parts of his property to the chiefs. So I think this is worth reading out loud. Prior to the Mahele of 1848, once again, this is an instruction to the jury. The people of Hawaii, through the sovereign, owned all the land, including roads in the kingdom of Hawaii. After the Mahele, now, a lot of people would argue things really changed after the Mahele. But what the court was instructing the jury was this. After the Mahele, private roads could be constructed on private property, but roads that were formerly public remain so. So if you have a road that you can take back and determine was actually in existence before 1848, it remains public. That's what that's saying. 
In this case, if you find that a trail or road was in existence before 1848, you must conclude that the trail or road is public. So that makes that pretty clear. And there are examples, and in fact, we were able to show the jury that Haleakala Trail, its predecessor, was in existence before 1848. And the jury, uh, that's one of the jury determinations that this was a public trail because it was in existence before 1848. And uh, this is, now goes to what was conveyed away when the land that Haleakala Trail was part of what was conveyed away to the private, what private rights were given away. And what you'll find is a reservation of rights that's, that's common in um, almost all deeds, and if not, I would argue that it's actually implicit in the deeds that it's not shown in. And that's that always reserved in the conveyance of private property here in Hawaii are the rights of the people therein. Now there's some that would argue that that actually goes to Kuleana rights, um, but it's, it's our position that that is a much broader concept than just Kuleana rights. Two years after the Mahele, so you've got to imagine what must have been happening during that period of time. There's this conveyance of pri pri private property. You have people possibly posturing about what they own now, those kinds of things. Two years after the Mahele, you have the Kuleana Act. And the first part of the Kuleana Act definitely relates to native tenant rights, customary tr and traditional access rights. But the very last part says, and by the way, we're, this is one of our um, uh, uh, pieces of evidence to the jury. We had over a thousand documents uh, that were presented in the course of this six-week trial. And uh, they were usually summarized in, the, in this fashion on a PowerPoint presentation. But this is one of the documents we found. This is a Polynesian newspaper, one of the early newspapers. And people at that point in time, the law was so significant that they were reading the whole statutes were being printed word for word in the newspapers. People were reading this. And this is what I go back to recollection. People at that point in time, landowners, Hawaiians, anyone else, they understood. People were talking about this stuff. This wasn't just ivory tower things. These were people... This was embedded in people's memory at the time. They understood these things because they were really, for the first time, writing down things that already existed, that were part of the oral tradition, that were already part of the, the, the customs of Hawaii. So it says, the springs of water, running water, and roads shall be free to all. So that part um, of the Kuleon Act is very powerful because we have, after 1848, a statement that roads shall be free to all. There's a very strong commitment there that these are to remain public even though there's now this private property concept that's happening in Hawaii. Now we move um, to um, Queen Liliuokalani's last year uh, in, as a queen. And this is one of her last um, acts that she was able to sign. But what's important is that this was a legislative act. It was a, a combination of all the different power players at the time, and I think that's quite significant. And once again, this is a reiteration of things that were already known and already existed, but it was a confirmation of it. And this act, like the other ones that we talked about before, the Kuleana Act, the Hawaii Constitution, they remain codified in our current Hawaii Revised Statutes. I think I've got a slide where I can go back and point that out to you. But what we have is really a Summary of the Highways Act as it was read by the judge to the jury. All roads and trails in the Hawaiian Islands, whether now or hereafter opened, laid out, or built by the government, are hereby declared to be public highways. The next part is very important. Once established, a road shall continue until abandoned by due process of law. So let me unpack this, this statute for you a little bit that was created in 1892. What it means is that trails, and this is something that the court agreed with us on, despite a lot of oppositional uh, interpretations of it in the course of our case, the court agreed that if there's a trail in existence back before 1848, it remains in existence. If it was in existence and it was used by the public before 1892, it remains public. If it was even later, after 1892, open or laid out or built by the government, which is a separate way that you could prove this up, 
that also is a way to show that it remains a public trail or a public road. Once it becomes a public road through any of those various ways, it always remains so unless there's an express, this last part means unless there's an express declaration by the government, whether it would have been the Hawaiian government or the territory of Hawaii or now the state of Hawaii, an express declaration conveying away that the state's rights or the government's rights in that trail or road. So what that means is if someone can't say, ah, that was abandoned a long time ago. You can't say that with this Highways Act, and that's very, very valuable and very different from what might be the concepts in other states. Here in 1892, the lawmakers and the Queen recognized that it was important for this to not get chipped away at, probably because what they were actually seeing was already people being uh, uh, deterred from using trails at that point in time. So this was a protective statute that remains today. In the 1970s, when the legislature first started debating this, they identified the Highways Act as something that they wanted to reinvigorate. Uh, and so in the 1980s, the Na'ala Heli Trail Program was created. I'll talk about that a little bit more in just a minute. And that, uh, once again, restates this law. So this is part of your recollection now that you can tell, pass on to other folks, is that these are not ivory tower laws or regulations, they're the real deal. They're used in court and they have uh, been successful in deter determining public ownership of trails based upon being debated and argued in court. But, and this is the Daily, uh, Daily Bulletin, another early newspaper which uh, once again was uh, showing the Highways Act being published. Once again, it was very much in the public eye at the time. So we've just gone through this upper layer of Hawaiian laws that were expressly reserved and protected through the Judiciary Act. And then we have the Western laws, which obviously came over as well. And the one, I think most people understand the public trust doctrine. I'm not going to spend much time on that. I want to uh, try to close here pretty quickly. But I want to speak for a second about public dedication. And don't read this. I, I, because uh, it's just too many words right now. The one I'd like for you to focus on, I'm citing from a case, and the importance of all this that's written here is this is a Supreme Court case, uh, or an appellate court case, application of banning. The uh, party asserting this uh, public dedication argument that I'm going to talk about in a minute was actually the state of Hawaii, which I think is very important. And the court recognized that the law of public dedication is live here in Hawaii. In fact, based upon the research that we did, we probably found um, six to eight cases going back to the 16, uh, I believe going all the way back to the 1600s relating to public dedication. So it's been recently re-enunciated here in, in uh, Hawaii. And there's also been a couple of really important trail cases in California that have used the same concept. What's different about this from the other one is that the Highways Act was a government proclamation and it shows that the ownership is vested, even though it's a public trail, it's vested in the government. The thing that's a little bit different here is that you have public dedication. And the way that this works is that, um, is that if you have, and I think the simplest concept, and it's a bit of a s simplicity, as always is in the law, there's all sorts of caveats, but I think the thing that's, that's the easiest way to think about it is if there's been extended use of a trail and you know that, then it's most likely a, a public right of way. It needs to continue to be used, but how much continuous use is necessary hasn't really been litigated that much. So, the concept here was that the courts recognize that if people have continuously used a trail across private lands, even if it's not a government trail, so this is separate and distinct from the Highways Act, even if it's not a government trail under the Highways Act, if people have continuously used a trail for their appropriate period of time, and that varies depending upon the case, then there can be an easement in favor of the public based upon that. So a very powerful and important concept. Um, and the way I, I think about it is uh, it's so important for us to map and understand where the trails are because use it or lose it. So we're in a really critical time right now where we need to um, identify, map our trails and um, use them where we can. 
The public trust doctrine is really a concept that I want to talk about in terms of who must um, protect public trust assets. And trails are a public trust asset just like water is a public trust asset. And we have lots of case law that strengthen that point here in Hawaii, and many of you in the room I know know that. So the thing I want to just focus on here for a minute is um, there are statutes that apply to county commissioners, at, like HRS 115, which is just, I, the purpose statement is just profound. This is the legislature saying that in absence of public access to Hawaii's shorelines and inland recreational areas, constitutes an infringement upon the fundamental right of free movement in public space and access to and use of coastal and inland recreational areas. I just think that's profound that our legislature identified access as a fundamental right. Um, it's doing it within the perspective of the need for local commissions, county commissions, to go out and acquire and protect access wherever they can, uh, either through um, acquisitions where you're just actually paying for it, that kind of thing. And that's certainly one of the tools that should be used anytime you're looking at any kind of trail issue. That, of course, people, fo folks here, a lot of folks in the room already know about the subdivision process and the fact that the county has an obligation when going through the subdivision process to evaluate um, the trails. And I guess the point I would just point out there that a lot of times is missed is it's not just coastal areas that need to be protected during the subdivision process, it's also inland areas. And they talk about uh, protecting it. This is from the statute where there are existing mountain trails. So once again, the importance of identifying these trails uh, could be helpful even during a, a subdivision process that might happen in your community. We have the Naala Heli Trail Program. This is another one of, I've been talking about county decision makers and their responsibilities, but certainly that applies to the state in terms of the Naala Heli, Heli Program and what um, what the state through DLNR is required to do, the Department of Land and Natural Resources. Um, I think this will just come up in later discussions, so I don't want to spend time on it right now, but what the legislature declared was that it was important for the identification and, and, and at least identifying ancient trails through this program and doing the legal analysis of whether there could be an, a, an assertion of a state right. And it's our position that this is an obligation that runs to DLNR as well as to local commissions, that they need to be actively involved in protecting trails where they might be a risk. I think the, this recent case that came from your island, the Kauai Springs case, um, which probably uh, hit the newspapers here uh, quite a bit, I would imagine, uh, and I've read the case a couple of times, and I think that this, even though that case deals with a water issue, I think it, when you read the case, and I have a portion of it here, it says, anytime you have an agency, and I think this is something you can just remind your, your decision makers, your commissioners, and your county council members, anytime you're dealing with a public trust asset, and I would include within those the trails, what the court's saying is we want agencies to, and commissioners to take particular care and give us a really strong, enunciated, and clear record of why they can permit a use that might harm a public trust asset. So I think this is, once again, our current uh, courts reminding commissioners that they are asking them, uh, or actually ordering them, to pay particular care in protecting these assets and to, in the process of making decisions, be able to state very clearly why something could diminish a public a asset right. And I think that can be very valuable as the trail cases continue. Just real quickly, we already looked at this. Um, I'll just tell you a couple of tidbits about the case, um, and maybe this afternoon we can talk about this more if it's something of interest, but there's always proving up a case. There'll be other people that are gonna be talking that'll talk more about this. Um, what we found was a, a bunch of maps, and this is one of the early ones from the 1800s. We called it the 1885 route because it shows up on a really important 1885 map. Then we had a map that we found, a USGS map from the 1922s. This is one of the important things is trails, going back and researching trails is a messy process because trails didn't, didn't always stay right where they were. They were meant to be dynamic when they washed out, they got moved. Landowners understood that at the time, that there was still a public trail, but it was getting moved and rerouted as things happened. So in our case, 
there was a significant rerouting because this was a trail that was used. Um, first, it was used by Hawaiians for all of the purposes I talked about before. But after Westerners arrived, by the late 1800s, this was being used to get people to the top of the mountain on guided, guided trips and things so that they could see one of the greatest wonders of the world, which was Hagalakwa Crater. Folks at that time weren't coming to see the beaches because they were wearing wool clothing and they couldn't, they were probably burning up down there. What they were doing instead was they wanted to see wondrous sights like this. So it was really important to get folks up. So there was, at first in the Kingdom of Hawaii, uh, did a, a public works project where there was an appropriation of funds. We were able to go back and find that. It's amazing what's at the state archives. So if you're digging into a case, these are the kinds of things you find. So we were able to show all the appropriations, sometimes the minutes of the meetings, and explain that to the jury and the judge as we were going through a case. But in this case, it was significant that it didn't end with the Hawaiian government. There was the territory that also did a, a big public works project to improve the trail and create those switchbacks. And it's a beautiful trail and it's well designed because it was done by an engineer. We have the appointment of the engineer, all those kinds of things. But going back, one of the things that we were able to show, now putting all that history, legal history I just gave you, was that we were able to show the jury that before 1848, there was all sorts of written accounts, even though there weren't maps. There were written accounts that we were able to get through publications and things like that, showing where people started. We started from Melinda. We started from Makawao. We continued up at nighttime. The trail was wide enough for a horse. These were the kinds of accounts that we were able to show. We were able to show that this was a trail that had been in existence before 1848 and was already heavily used, and no one talked about any other trail to the top of the crater. So even though we didn't have a map, because maps weren't being uh, drafted at that point in time and surveys weren't happening, we still had accounts that were powerful to the jury and the judge recognized that as relevant information that the judge was letting in. But then by the late 1800s, we're starting to get maps and we were able to show the jury that the maps are consistent with the early accounts in our case. And then finally we have the Highways Act. We were tying this all into when uh, the landowner took possession of the property and how that tied in with the early law as well as with what I was calling the Judiciary Act, the Hawaiian Usage and Custom Act, and the Highways Act, which was, both came in in 1892. Then, talking about the continuous use, we were able to show how that trail continued to show up on maps and be used over time, not just in the 1930s, but on into the 1970s. But it certainly, by the time we were litigating the case, not, uh, there was probably a, just a few people on the island that even knew about the Haleakala Trail. So it shows you that you can revive this um, over time. So with that, I'm going to stop right there. The one other thing I would just point out is obviously when you're in a court case, you have to um, be able to take the information and present it to a jury or present it to a judge in a way that's going to meet the legal requirements. And here it was very important for us to have the, all the background, the survey work, and all those kinds of things. And by the way, this is, a, this is a picture of Richard in the field working on it with our surveyor. And there's an ahu right here. Uh, that had been knocked over a little bit, but it's still in existence. And we were documenting that and putting it on, on our maps that we were able to show in various, various ways. This is a meets and bounds description that ultimately was the jury determined was the lo actual location of the trail. Because at a certain point, if you go to court, you do have to be able to verify its location on the ground. Recognize that gentleman right there? Uh, so this is actually a, a powerful... Um, this was a powerful exhibit because he, uh, Richard's showing the width of the trail here, and this was in a part of the trail that hadn't been used for decades, and it was still showing up very distinctly on the ground, uh, mostly because we were in a higher elevation area that hadn't had a lot of uh, cattle use or anything like that. There's another one of the Ahu, and then you can see some really nice um, early uh, rock work that was done along the trail in, in 1905. And I'm going to stop right there. And I thank you very much. I really appreciate uh, your attention, and I hope that was helpful in terms of being able to take this to the next step. This can't just be lawyers. It has to be people in the community who really um, understand enough to feel confident that when they, and I've heard everyone's got the right instincts here, feel confident that you're heading in the right direction and that there's law to back you up. Thank you.